Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Alexis, and I am a member of the Digital Artisan here at the Brooklyn Museum. <laughs> today, I will be. Um, today, I am honored to introduce Miss um, Allison Saar. Miss Allison Saar was born on February. 5th, 1956, Los Angeles, California. Ms. Saar is an American sculpture, painter, and installation artist whose work explores theme of identity, religion, African culture, diaspora, and spirituality. One recent major solo exhibition that Ms. Saar held was Slate, Suit, and Smut in 2016 at LA Louver Gallery, which was largely inspired by the effects of the 1927 Great Mississippi Flood. One thing that inspires me about Ms. Sarah's work is that all of her art is connected to the African diaspora and feminism. One artwork that I love is the Cotton Eater, which is the head, 2013. To me, when I look at the artwork, I can see the history um, of slavery where my ancestors used to pick up cotton in the field and based on how much cotton they picked up a day, they would get punished, um, endure severe beating, and potentially face death. So when the masters cut a slave head, then instead of throwing out blood, he throws out cotton. Because in my eyes, the slaves were treated as if they were not human beings, but tools. Um, I want to say thank you very much um, to Miss Allison Saar for keeping our history alive. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join your hands together for Ms. Allison Saar. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, and thank you fantastic. to all of the digital artisans. You guys have been amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, fantastic. Very cool. <laughs> um, and from that introduction, I just learned that you have the same birthday as my mother-in-law, and your birthday is three days after mine. So we are Aquarians. Good, good little scoop there, thank right? Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we're going to chat a little bit um, about some of Allison's work and also some of her mother, Betty Sarr's work. So this is a work that is in the show. Uh, you can see it upstairs, Sapphire from 1985. Um, so I just wanted to start with this and ask you to tell us a little bit about this work and about kind of if this is part of a larger body of work, um, a larger series. Um, it, it, none of the work is necessarily a part of the series. Um, you know, I did this piece and it's kind of you know, this is actually an interactive piece. Um, she should be um, standing closed and you are daring you to basically grab her by her tits and look inside of her. And it was kind of this sort of, um, you know, trying to uh, embrace that sexuality and that womanhood in a way that was kind of like, you know, yeah, okay, so you want to cross this line, then you better be prepared to face the consequences. And so the stuff inside of it, um, you know, was just stuff that I gathered on, you know, kind of just roaming the streets in New York City, anything that was read and anything that kind of felt to me that had some sort of power and fire. So it was about power and passion and um, the strength um, that comes with that. So. Mm -hmm. So you made this piece while you were living here in New York? Yeah, yeah, I moved back to Los Angeles in 95. So I was here 82 to 95, so. Okay. And, uh, and something, so when this first came to the museum, it was upstairs in conservation, um, which is always an amazing thing for us to see them kind of in that moment. Um, and something that really stands out, um, both seeing it there, but also in the exhibition, is the wood um, and you working with wood, which is not something that we see that often. So can you just talk very quickly about uh, the I mean, materials and your process? Yeah, well, the materials are, you know, I think maybe it's interesting being an artist and not being a sculptor and not having taken any sculpture classes, um, you know, is really kind of like just trying to make it out of whatever I had on hand. And actually it was a challenge living in New York initially working with wood. I would kind of like go through Central Park and gather twigs and get on the subway and everyone would just like leave the subway car because <laughs> we sit next <laughs> to the crazy lady with a bundle of <laughs> sticks on her back. Um, and so, you know, I had to kind of adapt the materials and um, in 83 and 84, I was at the Studio Museum mm -hmm. 
um, which was, you know, kudos out to the Studio Museum for providing so many young artists um, with the opportunity to work. Uh, and so some of that was where the ceiling tin started coming in. And so again, it was just materials that I would glean, you know, on the way to the studio and on the way back and just roaming the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, and, and then I guess, you know, my, my, my tool of choice is a chainsaw, so. That's my <laughs> Okay, we heard it here first. That's amazing. Um, well, the next thing we have, I want to take it a little bit, you know, several decades back. Um, this is a photo um, of your mother, Betty, who couldn't be with us for this right. opening, yeah. but her work is also upstairs, and we're so happy to have both of you. And in this photograph, she's standing in her studio in Los Angeles in 1970, holding um, a piece called Black Girl's Window from 1969, which is on view upstairs. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about growing up in Los Angeles as the child of an artist. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting with so many of the artists that have already spoken in terms of being a woman artist and having children and them living in this, uh, you know, li either living in the studio or the studio being in the kitchen. And so we were really constantly going around at the early, you know, on the onset, my mother was doing printmaking, so we would have like vats of acid next to the stove and things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, kind of precarious, but, you know, it was just something, and, and I think, you know, we were always given, um, you know, things, uh, materials to be making stuff while we were in that environment to basically get out from underfoot sort of thing. So, um, so that was really enriching. And then also, <clears throat> you know, we would also be dragged to, I say dragged, it felt like being dragged when, I, when you're five or six to openings and all these events. And so we were getting this, you know, early, you know, our vocabulary was really this art, art vocabulary and really we were reared by communities basically of other um, artists and black artists and black women artists specifically, so. Mm -hmm. um, and what, can you tell us what you told me earlier about what we see in oh. the top? Yeah, I'm represented <laughs> in there, that little, <laughs> Pigtail drawing is one of those, you know, like uh, kindergarten silhouette drawings that you do. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's your silhouette as no. a child. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that was also part of, you can see in the studio that it's a collection of a lot of different things. And so a lot of our drawings and my sister's and, and mine's drawings were incorporated into the work. And, um, you know, Black Girl's Window is really basically a biography, kind of looking at mm -hmm. her interest in terms of the occult and all of that as well. And then, you know, as she started kind of segueing, uh, you know, there's also, um, I keep looking backwards, I can look here, the, um, you know, and the con components of nostalgia and her own personal family, mm -hmm. and then just kind of starting to look into more political issues at the same time, too. Okay, wonderful. So that is a great segue to a piece that we have upstairs as well, Liberation of Aunt Jemima Cocktail from 1973. Um, and so this is a part of a series, a larger series, Liberation of Aunt Jemima, that combines the black power iconography. You can see the fist there on the, your right. Um, and on the front, the Aunt Jemima figure in a wine bottle turned into a cocktail. So do you see a relationship, and I'm sure you do you get this question all the time, you can, you can skip it if you do. <laughs> no. But what do you see as the relationship or how do you think about between your work and your mother's work or just is there one, um, whether, not necessarily in relation to this, just in general? Um, well, I mean, you know, I obviously, you know, gleaned a lot from just being in that environment and coming up. And I feel, you know, for my generation, we all owe a great deal of thanks and we're indebted to um, artists of my mother's generation, Faith, and everyone else that, you know, they, I felt they kind of paved that road for us to kind of step onto the stage. And in some ways, I, you know, I myself felt that maybe I didn't need to kind of fight that same fight. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember sometime like in the mid 80s, I got a call from Lucy Lepard saying, you know, we're doing this show called Art and Politics. I'm like, oh, you've got the wrong number. You, you've got the wrong SAR. <laughs> and I was like, you know, you need to talk to my mom. And she's, oh, no, no, no. You, know, you know, I'm talking about your work. And so, you know, I guess I, you know, because I didn't have um, hand grenades and, um, you know, hip slinging mammies with Uzis and stuff like that, I felt that, you know, maybe my work was less political. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, just in telling our own personal stories, it becomes political in terms of being honest and, and you know, 
maybe not quite as fierce as my other, but still trying to be fierce in my own right. I don't know. I mean, I think this is pretty fierce. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Okay. Um, and I, I think this is, yes, both incredibly fierce. I'm so glad that you shared that information about the actually I'm sorry, it's a museum, we can't allow people to, yeah, I to know. open and close it, but I love <laughs> that, knowing that, and I love that that's part of the motivation for these. Also, when she's closed, because she's got those little um, reflectors, her, her nipples light up, so. Her nipples <laughs> light up. Um, and I think, you know, you can't escape the kind of politics um, and the real kind of strident critique of women's bodies and their position in the world, so. Mm -hmm you know, maybe no, no guns, <laughs> but. So the last thing I wanted to talk about very quickly um, is this flyer from a yeah. festival <laughs> called the New Faces, New Voices, New Visions, which took place at Aaron Davis Hall in 1991. So this is, um, you see Alva Rogers here, um, and Alva Rogers oh. is sitting right here. <laughs> okay. what um, and this was um, a performance festival um, as I said, that took place in 1991 with two different performances relating to the Rodeo Caledonia High Fidelity Perform Performance Theater Collective that we will hear about um, in a later panel. But Allison, I was looking at this in the gallery and I saw, and I've looked at this a thousand times in the last however many months, and it's, it popped out to me, visuals, Allison Saar. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> so I just was very curious very quickly to hear about just your time in New York um, and your time mm -hmm. in the 80s and your kind of intersections with some of the other artists in the show who are of the, of the younger generation. Right, right. And in some ways, I kind of um, uh, felt, you know, maybe in, in, you know, because that my mother was so entrenched in Los Angeles in terms of, um, you know, like, the, the, the scene there was really like uh, Gallery 32 with Suzanne Jackson and we had Samela Lewis and all these other things. And it was just a really cohesive group of women artists. And when I came here, I didn't kind of immediately fall into that. So I kind of felt a little like, uh, you know, without my ballast in a weird sort of way. And, um, but ev eventually it really came about really just kind of looking at other people in the arts, working with uh, musicians like Alva and uh, Butch Morris and um, poets and stuff like that. So that's kind of where I found my footing and found my community with that. Um, and then later on some other organizations um, that were maybe more active. But uh, I just loved that it was, um, you know, just, uh, you know, just a, a, a rich opportunity to kind of expand in that. And I didn't get, Maybe the, I didn't really see that intersection with the music and the theater so much in Los Angeles. It was very mm -hmm. specifically the artist too. So when you went back to LA, you didn't see that, or because you, I'm sure, were back. When and I forth went back to LA, you know, you go back to LA and you've got two kids, and you, you know, I just never found that group again. I mm -hmm. never found that sort of community again, mm -hmm. so which is kind of sad. But um, and now, now it's interesting because I'm starting to reach out again to to writers and and other people and trying to get that back together now my kids are out of my hair and sort of things, you know, try to keep that. <laughs> uh, five minutes. <laughs> you leave in the no, I don't know. I can't read. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Um, well, thank you. I actually think that that is, okay. we're good. Well, just tell also, me, say, yes, please I mean, go. I, I really just really wanted, actually, can you hang on one second? I left something in my purse that I wanted to read today. And one, one second. Yes, we can wait. Go, see, look. You know, it, it of course kind of talks about the timeliness of this exhibition. And I'm um, trying to do my homework a little bit last night to kind of make sure I had dates and things straight uh, for this conversation. I looked at a video of um, my mother talking about the liberation of Aunt Jemima and her talking about, you know, well, you know, I'm not for violence, but, you know, this was the only way that I really felt that my voice could be heard by, you know, putting these hand grenades in Aunt Jemima's hands. And so, you know, being a, um, a glutton for punishment, I decided to scroll down to the comments. And, uh, right, everyone was like, oh, don't do that, right? <laughs> and so one of them was, you black folk make babies like Aunt Jemima makes biscuits. And I'm like, whoa. And i like, well, you know, and I looked at the date, and that was from 2016. And so, <laughs> it's a really important time for this show to be here. I think it's really important for um, so many, I don't know, I love going to these marches and seeing you know, babies with placards and stuff like that. And we all need to step that up. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> step back up to the plate. The game ain't over yet. Um, but anyway, thank you all so much and thank you for the show. Thank you.